Most people aren't prepared for what's coming to our world. Most people have no idea concerning the spiritual significance of the season that we now find ourselves in. And if we're not careful, if we lack discernment in this hour, if we lack spiritual preparation, then we may be caught off guard by some of the things that come our way. I think collectively, all of humanity understands that there is something big changing. Transformation is in the air. If you can sense that, and you're watching online, live, or on the replay, I want you to write that in the comment. Write, I sense it. And if you believe that, can hear sitting here tonight say, Amen. If you're watching online, write that. I sense it. Those three words, I sense it. And watch how many believers leave that comment. It goes to show you that you're not alone in what you've been feeling. Now, usually these feelings are accompanied by this sense of dread. Because if you're not careful and you're receiving your news from all around the world, from ungodly secular sources, you're going to be filled with fear. This is what the Bible says. Matthew 24, 37 to 39. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving. I just sensed a strong shift in the atmosphere. How many of you sense that right now? Marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered to the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Changes and chaos. And that's what's coming to our world. Now again, I am not a doomsday preacher, so there is hope in this message, but we have to assess the reality. I think especially in our circles, we have to be careful to not become superstitious about the way that we approach reality. Because sometimes I think people imagine that true faith denies the negative things that are happening. That's not faith, that's just delusion. To say, oh, that's not happening, that's not real, I don't receive that. And to some degree, I understand in some instances why some would say things like that. And there are times that sort of thinking is appropriate, especially if you're trying to set your mind on the things above. But faith does not deny reality. And the reality is that there is coming a shift in our world. In fact, it was already put into motion. How different is your life? How different is society? How much has culture changed simply in the last five years? There is an acceleration, an intensification. Things happen in seasons and in cycles. And if you look back at church history, you will see it. Intensification of persecution. Intensification of wickedness in the world. Intensification of strong delusion. Intensification of the spread of doctrines of devils. And whenever we see these signs of chaos and confusion and transformation, let it be known to the church that we stand on the word, we stand on the truth, knowing that in every season God has a plan. That when you see these things beginning to happen, recognize these are spiritual seasons and we're not the first generation of the church, nor will we be the last generation of the church, should the Lord tarry, that experiences this ebb and flow. It's the great setup for global revival. That's what the church should know. But here we see something interesting in Matthew 24 that should concern the wicked, the ungodly, those who do not know Jesus as Lord. The Bible tells us that there is coming a day 
There is coming a day of the return of the Lord. So while there are seasons, and while cycles do repeat, there will also be a final repetition of that season. When that is, who knows? But more than that, there is calamity that comes. Whether this is the last time we see the intensification of evil or not, whether this is the final cycle through in that season or not, what I do know is that it brings with it, for those who don't know the Lord, who aren't under that protection, confusion. Think of all the calamity that comes upon the world. Where do you turn when the systems of the world begin to fail? There is talk, sadly, of food shortage, strange weather, increasingly tyrannical government powers, disease, war, division, violence. Not just calamity, strong delusion. People losing their sense of reality and embracing lies around their identities, lies around their world, Lies around morality. Strong delusion. So if you begin to pull back the veil of that deception, they pull for the covers back over them. Like a sleeping child that doesn't want to be wakened, he, he, he pulls that blanket back over his face. That's what they do. You try to help remove that deception. It is strong delusion. Now, as I said, you look at the church history, you look at the history of the world, and you will see these cycles, intensification, intensification, each generation of the church thinking we're the last, and they very well could have been, and we very well could be. So don't hear what I'm not saying. We could be that last. But it always ends in victory for the church. It always ends in kingdom expansion for the church. But man has his ways of dealing, or at least attempting to deal with calamity and death. Think of those who avoid the danger by never taking any risk at all. You know, you can reduce your risk of being in a car accident by 100% if you never get in the car again. Just by being alive, you have a 100% chance of death. This is an attempt built into human nature. And cowards bring upon themselves the punishment of a wasted life. Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die... But after this, the judgment. So here's attempt number one. They're wanting to avoid danger. They want to avoid any harm. They live in that paranoia. They, they live in that cowardly state. And this is one attempt, but it's a fruitless life. It's a life with no joy. It's a life of misery. A second attempt that we see in the world is they say, let's just live it up. Chaos is coming. Things are falling apart. Just have a good time. And we see an example of this in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 7 through 12, where the wise man writes, Solomon writes, I'll just give myself to parting. I'll just give myself to the pleasures of this world. Nothing really matters. Of course, that wasn't his ultimate conclusion, but this is one attempt. And ultimately, this doesn't solve the problem. It just puts it out of their mind. Lying to themselves, this is how it will always be, they say. And those who live in such a way are failing to take into account eternity, judgment. So again, we see those who avoid danger, those who just embrace pleasure. And then there are powerful people, intelligent people, who try to escape this calamity through science and technology. Think about the expansion of knowledge. The rapid, exponential expansion of knowledge in just these last few years. You know they're working on a technology 
And I don't know how far they've come on it. And when I say they, I, I could be referring to any number of, a, of powerful organizations. But there's actually a technology that, in theory, they say they could take your mind, your brain, what makes you you, and they can take the digital information, the electrical information, however you want to put it, and they can upload your mind into a computer. I, don't know, I would not want to be trapped in a computer. I don't even know how, how you would exist in that way, but they're, they're working on that. Why? Because it's an attempt at immortality. And they say, well, if you can upload the mind, then surely you can begin to build out, you know, a, a, a computerized body. Limbs and arms and legs and a physical being that's made up of technology. This is, this is just, I'm just telling you what they're attempting to do. I'm not saying I believe this. <laughs> they have their breakthroughs in medicine. They have their breakthroughs in technology. They're doing their social engineering. And we have billionaires sending rockets out into space, hoping that we can be an interplanetary system. Why? Because man is ultimately trying to escape. Some cower in fear. Some just ignore the reality by living for pleasure. Others are attempting to intelligently approach the problem. We can solve the food shortages with science. We can solve disease with medical breakthrough. We can solve the problem of a decaying world by taking ourselves beyond the stars to other planets where we can find new places to build again. All of that still fails to take into account that the universe itself is becoming nothingness. For the scripture says, heaven and earth will disappear. My words will never disappear. Church, even if man could find a way to become indestructible, the very world in which he exists will one day cease to be. John 16, 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And all his attempts to avoid death, chaos, and destruction. Most people, man, fails to look to the one hope. There is only one escape. There is only one hope. His name is Jesus. And think about the fact that those who place their trust in him don't just escape what's coming to this world. That is coming. And that's not even really what I want to focus on tonight. That's just how I got your attention. Most don't know what's coming, and most aren't prepared for it. Why? Because most people are thinking, even when I say that, that I'm talking about the chaos coming to the world. No, my friend, I'm talking about the judgment day that's coming. I'm talking about the things that are coming after. I'm talking about eternity. Most aren't prepared for what's coming in eternity. They're so focused on this world around them, and there's nothing wrong with enjoying what God has created. But the truth of the matter is this. One day, every single one of us sitting in this room and listening to this message will pass into eternity. That's going to happen. That's, that's a certainty. Even if you take the route of having your mind uploaded onto a computer and you have a robot body, one day the universe itself will cease to exist. All of us will face the Creator, every single one of us. I'm going to stand judgment. You're going to stand in judgment, every single one of us. And the Bible makes it clear that God is storing up wrath for evildoers. Let me show you something here. This is what most people aren't prepared for. Romans 2.5. 
But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. This just isn't talked about anymore because it's not popular and it is quite offensive to some people who might misunderstand where you're coming from. But I have to tell you the truth. The truth of the matter is, if you don't know Jesus, you haven't received him as Savior and Lord, there is coming a day of judgment. And for every day that you go without repenting, you are storing up wrath for yourself. Think about the wisdom in withholding his wrath. For by withholding his wrath, God can both show grace and mercy and righteous judgment. Every day that goes by, for those who've rejected God, for those who've said to him, I want nothing to do with you, for those who've said to him, well, I went to church and the church made me mad. You've heard it said, well, people leave the church because there's so many hypocrites there. I say that's nonsense. They watch sports. There's a lot of hypocrites in the sporting world. They work at their job. I'm sure there's some hypocrites at work. No, 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 no. It wasn't the hypocrisy of another that caused you to reject God. It was the love of your sin, and you just found an excuse in them. You found, you found your scapegoat. And people reject him. Those who, who say, well, I don't even know if I believe in him. Well, they are lying to themselves, and they know deep in their hearts that they are. You tell me you don't believe in God, I'll call you a liar. Because deep within the heart of every human being, God has put a conscience. Romans 1 describes this. Your conscience bears witness to you that you're lying to yourself. Reject Jesus, the gift of free salvation, and, and, and they go on living their own life outside of God's will for their own pleasure, rejecting his ways. And for every day that they do this, they're storing up more and more wrath. Every day that goes by is another drop in the vessel of wrath. Every time you harden your heart, you're intensifying the judgment that will come down on you. Every time you turn away from the voice of the Holy Spirit in stubbornness, you're storing up for yourself that wrath that God will pour down on you. You might say, Brother David, this isn't very loving. It's the most loving thing I can do. I would rather offend someone into heaven than comfort them into hell. I would rather tell you a truth that sets you free than a lie that leaves you in bondage. And the truth of the matter is that God has provided a way of escape from this wrath, from this judgment. We've all sinned, myself included. The scripture declares, for all have fallen short of the glory of God, all have sinned. The scripture also declares that the wages of sin is death. In other words, the punishment, the payment, the penalty, what you get in exchange for sinning is death. And at first we look at that and we say, well, I, I don't know how I feel about that. And the reason that people are so offended by God's righteous judgment is because they're not offended enough by the wickedness of sin. This is the truth. And we say things like, well, I don't know if a loving God would do this. Yet our own way about us, our own sense of justice bears witness against us. How many times have you scrolled down a social media feed? You've seen a story about some heinous act committed by some criminal who, who did something that was so atrocious that it caused you to say, I hope they throw the book at them. I hope they put them away for life. I hope they get the death penalty. We do that when it comes to the sins of others. When it comes to the sins of others, we say justice. When it comes to our own, we cry out mercy. 
that sense of justice in all of us, that, that longing to see wrongdoing punished, that is the conscience. And God loves us so much that he's not just going to leave us in the misery of sin. He's not just going to leave you to your own ways because the end there is, is destruction. The Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. God saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the things we have done, the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I'll give it to you very succinctly. This is the message of the gospel, quite simple. Jesus will give you his eternal life in exchange for your temporary one. That's that simple. You know why people don't receive Christ other than pride, other than the love of sin? Those are really huge barriers, but another reason people don't come to him is because they just don't believe that they're good enough, and that is in part true. In fact, it is absolutely true that none of us are good enough to hold to that standard. And we imagine that, well, if I give my life to him, I'll probably just fail. And in failing, what's the point? Because I'll miss out on the pleasures of heaven and the pleasures of the world. Do you realize that the gospel is called good news precisely because of how this all really works. See, people, I'm here to tell you some really good news. Because if you were told that in order to be saved, you had to go to church on Sunday, Friday night Bible study, Monday night men, men's meeting, women's meeting, Wednesday night midweek service, and don't forget the leaders meeting, and don't forget the staff meeting, and don't forget the potluck, and don't forget the fellowship, and that if you miss one day, God forbid... You missed the day. Where's your commitment? Well, my commitment was to Jesus, not to you, first of all. That's religion. You see, you see, you see, religion is the belief that you can obtain salvation by your own works. So, so here's, here's the problem when we view it from a religious mindset. I can sense a strong anointing on this right now. When we view it from a religious mindset, we think that it's up to us to do enough good to save ourselves. There are so many problems with this. There are so many problems with this. Number one, if someone actually believes that their good works save them, and then they believe that they're saved, they're trusting in their own good works and are not truly saved. And they're self-righteous and full of pride. This is why there will be many, Matthew 7 tells us, who come to him and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? The Bible says in one translation, they'll come strutting up to him with confidence and then be stunned when he says, I never knew you. Stunned. And then, I love that same translation, says, all you did was use me to make yourselves important. And, and, and what we do is we wear Christianity like it's a nice decoration. A, a, a little bit of something that we added into our culture to teach the kids what good morals are. Something we do around the family table is we pray because it's a nice little idea. And they use Christianity like it's a culture, like it's a decoration on their life, rather than a total trust in what Jesus did on the cross. Here's how you know if you're living in a religious mindset. If you're constantly worried that you've made a mistake that's going to finally cost you your salvation, you believe a works-based gospel. It got real quiet right now. Why? Because then you believe that it not only was you that saved you, but it's you that's keeping you saved. Think about this, guys. 
Now, should we live righteous lives? Of course, but this is why the gospel is such good news. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Wait a minute, 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 wait a minute. This is where people get really paranoid. Because they say, you can't tell them that. Because if you tell them that, then they're going to go on sinning. I beg to differ. If someone truly comes to salvation, and someone truly puts their trust in Jesus... He's going to transform their nature and give them new desires. So watch this now. So if you heard that, that then in order to be saved, there's this list of rules that you have to keep. Yes, you ought to live a holy life. Yes, you ought to live good. Yes, you ought to do well. Yes, you ought to obey God's commandments. Yes, you ought to base your life off scripture. You know this is what I teach. But I'm talking now to someone in this room and someone watching who cannot come to the Lord, who will not come to the Lord, because you believe that when you do, it's going to depend upon your own strength. And I'm here to tell you that he said, I'll take your hard, stony heart, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. He said, I'll take your old nature, and I'll give you a new one. You're not going to be an old creation trying to develop a new mindset. For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. That's the miracle of salvation. That by turning to him and saying, I trust you. I I'm turning from my sin and I'm turning to you now and I believe in what you said because it's your soul now we're talking about. It takes a lot. I mean, you think about how very few people you trust with your kids. How very few people you trust with your car. How even fewer people you trust with your cell phone. <laughs> We're talking about your soul. That I would say to Jesus, I have one soul. I'm going to die one time. And eternity is a long, long time. But I'm going to trust you with my soul. I'm banking on the fact that you are who you say you are. I'm going to believe that you really did pay the full price for my sins. I'm going to believe that you really did do what needed to be done on the cross. Jesus didn't say, take it from here. He said, it is finished. And so, so when we come to this place where we're humbling ourselves, we, we, we come to Jesus and we say, okay, I'm a sinner I know that the punishment for my sin is eternal death, damnation, hell, and it's right that you do that. I'm not going to argue with you there. I'm not going to try to be philosophical and say, how could a loving God? It's because he's loving that he judges evil. Okay, I'm not going to try to get philosophical. I'm trying to reason. I accept it. I humble myself. I'm a sinner, and I deserve that punishment. You're a good, gracious God who's offered me a free gift of salvation, and all I have to do to receive it is believe. That's it. You know, ministering in different regions of the world, you, you, you minister the gospel, same message, different methods. But as I came here tonight, the Lord really dealt with me in dealing with a religious mindset. People just don't understand the work. So let me simplify it here. Imagine that in front of me is one door. And when I open that door and step through it, I shut that door, and now I'm walking in a long hallway. At the very end of this long hallway is one more door. I'm not through that yet. Here's how it works. When I believe and put my faith in him and say, what you did on the cross, I believe it. Not just say it, because that's not what saves you, but, but truly believe it, truly put my faith in it. What I just did is I stepped through that door. 
This is the door of justification. Say justification. I step through that door and I close it behind me. Now we can debate all day. Can you get outside the door or not? I don't think that debate matters. Because when someone walks away from the faith, whether they were never really saved in the first place or whether they lost their salvation, we all agree they still need Jesus, okay? So, so that debate, it, I don't even know why people have it. It's pointless. So, so they open the door, shut the door behind them. That is the door of justification. Justification is where I stand before God in righteousness. It's a legal verdict. You're justified. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness so now that door is shut this long hallway is sanctification it's the process justification the first door is my position the hallway sanctification is my process now when you put your faith in jesus you open that door and you shut it we're so worried about doing this which you do some days. And then if you didn't get much sleep, you do this the next day. And if the traffic is bad enough, you get close to the door there. <laughs> right? This is how you ought to see it. I, I'm sanctified. It's a process. I'm being, being perfected. That final door is the promise. That's glorification. It's when I'm like him. But, but here, here's, how, here's how religious people think their salvation works. I repented. I sinned. I repented, I sinned. They think they go in and out of that door. And so they ask questions like, well, what happens if I tell a lie and then I die before I say, Lord, forgive me? Well, then you're trusting in good timing, not the cross to save you. <laughs> you believe that not only did Jesus have to die, but that you had to die at the right time to make sure that counted. It's not good timing that saves me, my friend. It's the grace of God. And in that grace, I'm walking, sanctified, process. I may not look like him completely yet, but I know that one day I will. And, and no matter where I am in the process, I know where I stand in my position. So how do you get through this first door? How do you get to that place where you're, you know that you know that you know that you're saved? You trust him. If it was any more difficult, we'd ruin it. It's simple enough, and we still do. If I go in for an operation, I don't prep the night before by staying up late and reading textbooks on the operation I'm about to perform. Okay, I'm going to make the incision here. I'll apply anesthesia here. I'll make sure these medical professionals are... You're, because you're not the one doing the surgery. What do you do? You just get on the table. And by getting on the table, you're putting your faith in that doctor. Well, Jesus is the surgeon of the soul. And so when I put my faith in him for salvation, I'm literally throwing myself on him saying, you save me. I'm, I'm, I'm surrendering my will. I turn from it. You save me. And then you know what happens? He saves you. And do you know what happens when he really saves you? Your desires start to change. And when your desires start to change, nobody has to tell you, hey, you know, just because you're saved, you can't sin. Why? Because everything in you is, is desiring now to fight sin. Well, doesn't Galatians say that the spirit resists the flesh? People say, well, what do I do if I'm struggling with sin? Well, the very fact that you're struggling with sin is proof that you have the Holy Spirit. Because if you didn't have the Holy Spirit, who would be struggling against the flesh? Who would be there? You wouldn't be struggling with sin. You would just be sinning. So there's some people who, because of that religious mindset, they can't come to the cross because they say, okay, I got a lot of work to do. My friend, you have one job, and that's to surrender completely to Jesus. You have one job. It's to get yourself on the table. And let him perform his work. Salvation is for those who believe. I'm not saying you won't struggle. 
I'm not saying you won't have bad days. What I am saying is that by putting your faith in him, number one, you're acknowledging you can't save yourself. Number two, you are acknowledging that you are a sinner. And number three, you're acknowledging that only he can save you. And you're throwing yourself on him. You're, you're, you're doing a, a supernatural spiritual trust fall. And saying, I, I'm going to throw myself into eternity with only my hope in you. And I'm going to trust that you catch me. And you watch when you truly put your faith in Jesus. You watch how he begins to change you. Well, this is why James chapter 2 tells us that show me your faith and I'll show you my faith by my works. We don't do works to be saved. We do works because we are saved. So you're sitting in this room now. You've heard of the coming calamity. One thing we'd like to escape from, but all of us will face judgment. You've heard of the coming judgment being stored up, the wrath of God stored up every day for those who resist that truth. It's coming. And that is what I'm talking about tonight. Most people are not prepared for that day when they stand before God. You've heard of the gospel, the free gift of salvation. That's why it's good news. He did the work. And you can know that you know that you know heaven is your home, that Jesus is your Savior by putting truly, 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 truly putting your faith in him, faith alone, by grace through faith. He wants one thing, that's your faith. You say, well, I thought he didn't want works. No, faith in God does not count as a work. That's why the Bible says, by faith, not by works. In God's mind, faith is not a work. That surrender that comes through faith is all you need to do. You simply have to get on the table. Let him do what he does. So you're in this room tonight and you're struggling within yourself. You hear this talk of God's wrath to come and you know in your heart that you're not living right. That if you were to die today and stand before God that you would be judged harshly for your sins and God in his righteousness would be right to do so myself included. You're hearing now of this truth. I can just put my faith in him and he'll save me even though I don't deserve it. Even though I don't have all the answers. Even though I might not be able to do it perfectly. And you want that. Friend, tonight you have a choice. Accept or reject Jesus. You're not rejecting me. You're not rejecting a message. You're not rejecting a sermon or a philosophy or a religion or a culture. When you reject the gospel, you reject Jesus himself. You say, I don't want that. I want that free gift. I want what Jesus did on the cross to apply to me. I'm going to have you do something in a moment. But I'll tell you this right now. This is about your eternity. You can ignore what's being said. You can leave here tonight dismissive of the words that are being spoken here. You'll get in your car. You'll drive home. No cameras, no lights, no music. You'll put your head on your pillow 
still carrying the weight and the shame and the guilt of sin. And deep within your heart, you'll tell yourself, I should have responded. Or, you can receive Jesus tonight. Turn from your sin. You walk out these doors, you'll get in your car. There'll be no music, but there will be a song in your heart. There'll be no lights shining in your face, but you'll see things through a new light. And you'll get in your bed, you'll put your head on your pillow. And you're going to notice for the first time ever that the weight and the burden and the shame and the guilt of sin is nowhere to be found. And you'll say, I'm so glad, I'm so glad that I received Jesus. But I'm going to challenge you to do this publicly now. Because being a Christian is not something you do in secret. Jesus said, you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father who is in heaven. You accept me before man, I'll accept you before my Father who's in heaven. You want that. Inside, there's that internal struggle. I don't want you to fight. No more running from him. No more running. Tonight's the night. You're ready to give your life to Jesus. I don't want you to think about it. I don't want you to look around the room to see if anybody else stands with you. If you're the only one standing, so be it between you and the Lord right now. But if you're saying, I want Jesus, I'm ready to receive him, I'm ready to turn from my sin, then I want you to stand to your feet right now. And as you remain standing, remain standing, please. Those of you who are standing, I'm going to ask you to do another thing. I want you to come walk down those aisles, even from the back, and I want you to come stand and face me right here. Stand and face me. Come. Come. Church, can we give the Lord a hand of praise for this? They're still coming. There's still more. They're still coming. Look at the children coming too. <laughs> Make room for them. Make room for them. Wow. They're still coming. Wow. Isn't this awesome? Guys, don't ever forget the privilege. Don't ever forget the privilege. These are lives that are about to be transformed. Do you remember, Nick, when you first got saved? They're having that experience right now. Do you remember that? Just like you, you, you just for the first time ever, that burden lifted from off of your shoulders. That's what's happening for them tonight. The Bible says, He that began a good work in you, is faithful to finish it. Tells me two things. Number one, he began the work. It's not me. It's not my ability. Number two, he's going to finish it. In the Bible, you will not find what is often referred to as the sinner's prayer. But what you will find are sinners who pray you do find is the Bible speaking of public expressions of a deeply sincere faith in what Jesus has done. So let it be known that I'm going to lead you in a prayer, but it's not this prayer that saves you. Prayer has never saved a single soul. Only Jesus saves. Prayers have been offered to deities, false gods, and spirits of all sorts. Very few of them resulting in actual salvation. 
This prayer, though it is not what saves you, is how you're going to address him. It's how you're going to express this new faith that you're now coming to. And if it is not said sincerely in the depths of your heart, then it is not true. Prayer does not save you. Just know that. Hands lifted all across this room right now. And you standing up here, lift your hands like, like you're asking God to pick you up. Can we pray this with them too, church? As I pray, say, Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner. I admit I've done wrong. I've broken your commands. I've not lived like I should. And I know I cannot save myself. There's nothing I can do to pay for my sins. But I thank you. Say it again. But I thank you that because of your mercy, you paid for my sins. Through the cross, through Christ, through his death. Thank you. Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus. Today, I receive that free gift of salvation. Today, I receive what Christ did on the cross. And now, Lord, I ask you, forgive me, save me. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he sits at God's right hand. I believe he's coming again. Jesus, thank you for being my Lord, my God, my King, my friend, my Savior. And I declare by faith, as I believe that I am now and forevermore born again in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can we give the Lord a hand of praise for new souls coming to the kingdom? Thank you, Jesus. Now, I want to do one more thing before you go. I want you, standing up here, to face the people out there. Come on, face them real quick. Can we welcome our new brothers and sisters into the family of God? To Jesus belongs the glory. Let's sing, I surrender all, as you go back to your seats. God bless you. Welcome to the kingdom. Thee, my blessed Savior, sing it out. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Now, here's what I want to do, and we'll sing it again right now. Those of you watching online, if you just gave your heart to Jesus and you committed to Him 
This is going to be powerful, I know it, because there's several people watching. If you're watching online right now, and you just gave your life to Jesus, you just accepted the free gift of salvation, I want you to do something for me. I want you to write two simple words in the comment section, whether you're watching live or on the replay, I want you to write two simple words, born again. Two words, born again. Now, I'm going to see the comments coming in right now. There is like a one minute delay we have just to make sure that nothing, you know, nothing goes wrong technically. But we're going to start to see various comments coming in. Already I'm seeing people say amen. Someone's saying, I surrender everything, Lord. Your angels are rejoicing, someone writes in the comments. All Night Podcast writes, born again. Sarah, born again. Eliza, born again. Brenda, born again. Zaria, born again. Alshita, born again. Isabel, born again. Jesus Army 7, born again. Jeff, born again. Jess, Rose, Arnold, Mia, Mandy, Daniel, Jacob, Myla, Vasquez, Gerardo, Miriam, MK, Sharon, Suman, Jacob, Liz, Sarita, Rosie, Jason, Sandra, Julie, born again, 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 born again. Can we give Jesus a mighty shout of praise? seeing souls come into the kingdom like that. Do you remember when Jesus was with the woman at the well and his disciples brought back a meal for him and he didn't want to eat. He said, the food I have, you don't know anything about. And they're like, did someone bring him food? He says, no, my, my, my food, my sustenance is to do the will of the Father. These, these aren't just people standing in front of a platform. These aren't just numbers that we count and get excited about. Each and every individual, each and every face is a soul. Do you remember when you first received Jesus as Lord and the burdens were finally lifted? They just experienced that, and we just saw that all across this platform. Power of God. The miracle of salvation. Ishmael, as you stay with me. You know, church, this hour is the greatest opportunity for the church. It's the greatest opportunity for the church. I'm still looking at people coming in, born again, born again, born again. I, 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 get, I get lost in it sometimes. I'm just going to see what they're all saying here. Look at that. Wow. And as I look at these comments and people coming in from all around the world, and I can't help but think, man, what if we just stood back in fear? 
what if we just said, you know, these names, these people, we don't want to take too many risks, so we can't, we can't really go out and tell them. I'm telling you, this is opportunity time. This is opportunity time. This, this is the hour. This is the hour. Well, well, so many are afraid and holding back and shrinking back. This is the hour. I don't, I don't want to miss opportunities like this. When you stand before God, you're not going to wish that you owned more houses. You're not going to wish that you had more cars. You're not going to wish that you wore nicer clothes. You're going to wish you had one more. One more. Now, I want to talk to you about giving to this ministry tonight. And, you know, as you were coming in, I don't know if they did it or not, but as you were coming in, you should have received a flyer. Did they get those, Ruben? They did? Okay. On there is just basically a, a link that will show you event giving. Let me say this before I take the offering. Do you know that we don't charge for our live streams? We don't charge for the media. Some people tell me all the time, oh man, with your teachings, you should put, people would pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I say, but what about the people who can't? They, they don't deserve to know the word. People say, oh, for your conferences, your, your, your conferences, you could, you, could, you, could, you could charge a register. You know, most conferences and I'm not trash-talking anyone because everyone does ministry the way they believe is right, and they're not my servants, they're God's. But there are some conferences, Christian conferences you'll go to, it's $250, $500 per person to get in. That's true. Do you know that we even paid for the parking here tonight? We had to pay for each individual parking because I can't help but wonder, what about that single mom who drives three hours, who budgets for gas, and you know how gas prices are now. She budgets for gas, and she says, I'm going to go to that meeting, and then she gets here and finds that there's a $20 parking fee and has to turn around because she doesn't have it. I believe we have to remove as many barriers as possible between people and the gospel. So we don't charge for the media. We don't charge for the live streams. Those of you watching, we don't. It's not behind a paywall. You can watch it. We have a one-word strategy for our income. People say, I'm crazy. I just might be. It's a one-word strategy, faith. What happened to good old-fashioned faith? Some of the greatest ministries have ever touched the world. It's all by faith. Give it for free and let God speak to the people. And so that's what we do. Now, for a conference this size, I mean, you, you enjoy the music, you enjoy the quality that we put it in. We have enough space for everyone in a conference center. These conferences, I'm going to show you, if you, if you go on the, the little flyer, some of you were already looking at it. There's a link there. It shows you how much the event is, and it gives you a breakdown of where we spent it so you don't think I'm trying to you know, buy jewelry with, uh, you know, event money. We have, or, or you know, uh, whatever, you, whatever people buy. You'll notice that everything's broken down. You can see itemized everything that we paid for this conference. Now, conferences like this, this is what they cost. Doing it on this scale, this is what it costs. Our event here tonight, for two nights, is going to be $140,000. You go, oh my gosh, don't worry, it's not all going to come on one person, unless God speaks to one person, and then we're, then we're good. But you know, I'm not worried about it, because I believe God's people are generous and giving and kind and loving, and, and I, don't, I don't really have to pull. I'm going to give you a little encouragement right now, but I just want to explain something so you understand where we're coming from. You know, it costs money to do these things with excellence and on this scale, this size of an event, you have to, you have to, we used to try to do it in churches. We just, we were turning away too many people. It got to the point where every time we were in a church, 
there was 50 or 60 people who just, we could not fit them in the building. We had to start turning people away. So the next best thing is we had to move to conference centers. But that's when the price jumped. Now, I want to keep doing these. I really do. But for the last three events, the, the conferences, we did not meet the conference goal. Now, this does not affect the ministry as a whole negatively because what we do at the beginning of the year is we put money in an event account. And that event account is for events, and if, if, it, if, it, if it depletes, it depletes. We just wait for the next year to start doing events again. So we need to make sure this one is met so that we can begin planning for next year. But people of God, here's all it's going to take. It's going to take you sitting in this room doing your absolute best. It's going to take you watching online doing your absolute best. There's over 1,200 of you joining us online right now. Now, we've watched the live streams later, and we find whenever I take the offering, the viewership dips, and then they come back 10 minutes later when it's back to the preaching. But I, I want to encourage you watching online too. Help us out. You can be involved as well. If everyone watching online, everybody watching online, the 1,200 of you watching online gave $10, that would almost meet the need right there. And then I'm sure the rest here could do it. But I'm saying this, the average gift we calculated, don't feel pressure to do this if you can't. But this is what registrations usually cost. It's about $250. If you don't have that, don't worry. We're glad you're here. I'm glad you came. And you're saying, I don't have any money. Well, you're why we make it free. Because otherwise, you would have missed out, and we don't want you to miss out. So I'm asking those whom God has blessed, and that is most of us here who have resources. I understand what the world's talking about. Like I said, I'm going to encourage you right now, but I want you to understand why we do what we do. So you look at that link on the flyer, and you'll see a breakdown. Not only that, you'll see how close we are to our goal. You'll see that right there, and it's like a little bar that, that loads up. So let me read something to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 12. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. The one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Verse 7, you must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. What a great promise. I want to encourage you tonight to go from provision to prosperity. Now, I believe in prosperity, though I reject the prosperity gospel. I'll tell you the difference. The prosperity gospel is the promise that you will always be healthy, wealthy, and happy if you just give enough. That's not what the Bible teaches. What the Bible does teach is that when you exercise generosity and practice good stewardship and implement wisdom, that God increases your resources not so that you can use it for yourself, but so that you can have your needs met and so that you can be a blessing to others. And that's what the promise is here. So how do you move from provision to prosperity? Because the reality is, Every single one of you are going to be provided for, whether you give or not. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you you're cursed because you don't put anything in the offering plate. You can't curse what God has blessed. The Bible says that Jesus broke every curse. But what I will say is that there still is honor. That's the principle, honor in that which predates the law. Honor. Giving to God because you honor him, because you love him. And people... You hear things on the news all the time. Inflation is on the rise. Currencies are losing their value. World systems and economies are being shaken. Food shortages and interest rates. And it's enough to make your head spin. And if we're not careful, we listen to those things and we allow our hearts to be filled with fear. I know you even though I don't know you. You love to give. You love to give for souls. You love to give to the kingdom. You love to give to good causes. That's who you are. That's your heart. You're good-natured because of the Christ in you. 
But here's where the enemy gets us sometimes. He lies. And he says, if you give generously to that ministry, you're not going to have enough for what you need. That's really all it comes down to. I remember for the first few years that I was married to my Jess, I can tell you, Jess did not marry me for money. Or maybe she saw potential, I don't know. But, you know, there were months where the, the ministry did well and months where it didn't. So to make up for it, I would do what's called ghost writing. Some of the Christian books you've read, I wrote. And then I sold it to the author who, wrote, who, who took the credit for it. That's how it works in, in, in the publishing industry. hate to break your heart on that. So if it's possible you've read something I wrote, you didn't know I wrote it. Um, but that's another story. But that's how I used to pay. So when, when, when the ministry did okay, I said, okay, i got to take up another project. And we'd get through and we'd sit down and we'd look at our bills. And there were some months when I'd look at what was in my account and I'd look at what was due in the bills. And what was in the account wasn't enough to cover what was in the bills. And every month I decided I'm going to give to God first. And I can stand here as a testimony of God's provision that every single time God met the need. Every single I don't know how he made a way where there seemed to be no way every time he met it. And today I can stand here as a testimony of not just provision but of prosperity. How do you cross over? First you have to realize you're not going to lack did you hear what I said? Stop believing the lies of the false prophets. I'm talking about CNN, NBC, Fox, ABC, false prophets, a bunch of lying devils. Did you hear what I said, guys? Bunch of liars. Okay, yeah, maybe there are some tough times that we're in right now. Maybe the nations are being shaken. Even if... Faith doesn't say what if, that's fear. Fear says what if, what if, what if. Faith says even if. I'll tell you this right now. Even if it's as bad as they say it is, even if it gets as bad as they say it will, I know I belong to him. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging for bread. You're not going down. Did you hear what I said? You're not going down. God's going to provide. Your ministry's not going down. Your business isn't going down. Your finances, God is going to provide. And here's the key. Just trust him. That's provision. He's going to provide for you all the time, no matter what, whether you give here tonight or not. You never hear a preacher say that, do you? Whether you give here tonight or not, he's going to provide for you. But to move into prosperity, that's the increase. You have to believe in provision. Because only when you believe that God will provide, does it free you to give? And so I'm asking you, as we as a ministry have stepped, think about what we're doing. We're expanding a TV studio. We're doing these massive events, all in the middle of calling one of the worst recessions the, the U.S. has ever known. And our ministry has not been affected by it. How? I'm telling you how. Faith. 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 And so I'm challenging you tonight to give something significant, help us meet this goal so that we can use what's left over on the studio project. We can use it to do other things. Help us meet this goal. So go ahead, and what we're going to do is we're going to take the pass out the envelopes. Now, I'm going to instruct you to do something. Those of you here, you can pull out your phone. You got the little flyer. I want you all to go to that link where it says on the flyer. You should see it, and if you need help, let us know. Um, also, take an offering envelope and pass it down. Those of you present, there's two ways you can give. You can scan the code on the envelope or on the, link, uh, on the flyer, or you can give using the envelope. Those of you online, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. The rest of you, I'm going to challenge you here. Like I said, those of you watching in here, I'm going to challenge you guys. Do not let the enemy win this round for fear versus faith. To step out in trust knowing that he is going to meet the need. And in doing so, knowing that, that this is not a problem for God. I'm asking you to do something significant. I'm asking you to do something lavish. I'm not asking you to do anything I've never done before. I do as the Holy Spirit speaks too. And I'm asking you to let him move you to generosity. Don't just tip him. This is something that we cherish, we value. 
Show the Lord that you value ministries like this. Show the Lord that you value soul winning. Show the Lord that you value his kingdom. Now, as you give, as I said, you look at that flyer, you can see the progress we're making. You can see how you're giving, if you give using the QR code, you can see how your giving is affecting the overall income. And you're gonna kinda get an idea of why it takes so many people doing what they can. And again, I ask you to give your absolute best that the Lord might meet the need. And you online, I know it's tempting to say, well, I'm watching online, so I'm not technically a part of it. No, the Lord brought you here for a reason. And I'm asking the people of God to choose faith over fear. I'm asking the people of God to choose faith over fear. Thank you to all the online givers. Thank you to those of you giving in person. I'm going to give you some time to fill out that envelope. I won't take too much more time, though, because I know we want to move on to the next portion of the service. But I'm seeing Etson and Gail and Carol and Andrea and Bonnie and Melissa and Daniel and Veronica and Lisa and Darla. Thank you. And Caroline and Raymond and Chris and Monica and Eddie and Mina. Thank you for your giving. Scott and Eliza and Darren and Matt, and Jacqueline and Joseph and Stephanie and M Magdalene. It's a, a beautiful name. And then Giselle and Brandon and Joshua, Sharika and Justin and Roxanne and Brianna. So many of you giving. Thank you. So give your gift, watching live or on the replay, and help us meet that need. So how many of you can see the progress bar here in person? Let me see. Raise your hand if you saw it. If you haven't seen it, you've got you to look at the flyer the, um, and, or, or scan the QR code on the envelope. You can actually see it. And maybe we'll show that to you later on too. But that's how you, that's how you get involved. And I'm looking at it now. There is progress being made. Thank you so much for your giving. I do not take it lightly. We're going to minister to those who need healing and deliverance. And as I said, the power of God is going to fill this room. We know that in a very intense, a very manifested way. But we have to take care of God's house first. We have to demonstrate our love through this act of worship. How many of you need a little more time filling it out? Let me just see. Okay, so we're good. If you're filling out an envelope, make sure to fill it out completely. If you're giving by your debit card, if you're giving by a check, you don't have to because all your information is on your check. But, but again, we ask you in your giving to be generous, and I want to thank you for that. I don't take that lightly. I know with all that's going on in the world, it can be a little scary, but like I said, we're living proof. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Hold your envelope up, those of you who are giving. And if you gave online, hold your hand up. I want to pray right now that God would bless you. Don't just take this as some cliche part of the service. I really want to pray that God will bless you. How many believe that? That he would keep you, that he would provide for you, that, that what they say is coming would not affect you or your children or your family. Do you believe that? I said, do you believe that? Then lift your hands, pray out loud in the Holy Ghost right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come against lack. And Father, I pray that you would rebuke the devourer because of their giving. Father, I pray that not only would they be provided for, but Lord, that they would have enough left over for their children and for their grandchildren, for their family and their friends. Lord, make them examples of generosity. Show them off as good stewards of your resources. Lord, we thank you that you've given to us. Now we give back to you lavishly, lovingly. Our hope is in you, and we thank you that you provide. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said? And the church said? And the church said? Now stand to your feet, and as the buckets pass, put your gifts in the buckets. Lift your voices. Pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Kondo robo bosa.
your strength, to your influence now. Lift your hands and welcome him, church. I want you for the next 30 to 60 seconds, pray loudly and boldly in the Holy Ghost. Go, 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 go. Keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. I'm telling you, things in the heavenly realm are shifting as you pray out loud in the Holy Ghost. Bondages are breaking as you pray out loud in the Holy Ghost. Sickness is losing its power as you pray out loud in the Holy Ghost. Whoa, 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 whoa. Church, something is happening here. I speak now to that prince demon over this atmosphere, over this region, and I declare that every religious demon has lost its power and authority. We, the people of God, we declare that this region belongs to the Holy Ghost. You need to pray, 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 pray right now. There are religious powers losing influence now as we pray. There are religious powers. We bind powers of manipulation and witchcraft. We bind powers of religious spirits. We bind powers of legalism. We bind that barrier of tradition that gets in the way of the Holy Ghost. If you believe it and you believe it's happening, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. I told you something would happen here tonight. I told you something would happen here tonight. It's happening now, it's happening now, it's happening now. For you are glorious and worthy to be praised. You're the
God that healeth thee. I am the Lord, your healer. He's singing this over you. I sent my word and I healed your disease. I am the Lord, your healer. As you continue to play that, Ishmael, the scripture says in Luke 18, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind beggar was sitting beside the road. When he heard the noise of a crowd going past, he asked what was happening. They told him that Jesus the Nazarene was going by. So he began shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet. The people in the front yelled at him. But he only shouted louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and ordered that the man be brought to him. As the man came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, he said, I want to see. Jesus said, All right, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see and he followed Jesus, praising God. And all who saw it praised God. A blind beggar crying out to Jesus. Others rejected him, telling him, be quiet. Be quiet. Jesus. Here's his cry. I'm here to remind you tonight that Jesus, the Son of God, the one who opens the ears of the deaf, the one who opens the eyes of the blind, that Jesus, the resurrected Son of God, is passing by Kansas City tonight. And I'm here to tell you that he's going to hear your cry. If he did it for him, he'll do it for you. Lift your hands, begin to talk to him. Come on. You don't need to beg. You don't need to plead. Just ask him tonight for his healing touch. You are the God that healeth me. You are the Lord, my healer. Tell them, church, you sent your word. You sent your word, and you healed my disease. You are the Lord, my healer. Every voice lifted now as we cry out. You are the God.
in the name of Jesus I speak to every sickness and disease now and I command it to come under subjection to the authority of Christ knee injuries be healed heart problems be healed cancer be healed in the name of Jesus tumors go paralysis be healed skin disease be healed issues with organs and problems with functions of the body be healed nervous system be healed digestive system be healed I command those ears to open. I command those eyes to see in the name of Jesus. Now is the moment. Ask him, ask him, ask him, ask him. That's his healing power flowing through this room right now. In the name of Jesus. Wow. I see that healing now. That spirit of death, I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Put down that walker in the name of Jesus. Come out of that wheelchair in the name of Jesus. Be made whole tonight. Some of you are feeling like a heat. Come on, you. Others, you're feeling like a weight. Others, you're feeling absolutely nothing other than you haven't checked that the pain is gone. Keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. Receive your healing tonight. Lift your voices, lift your hands.
disappearing. I said tumors are disappearing. Check for the tumor now, you'll find that it's gone. I give you the glory, Lord. I give you the glory, Jesus. I give you the glory, Jesus. We honor your mighty name. We honor your mighty name. Shoulder injuries just been healed. A shoulder injury has just been healed. I give you the glory. Digestive issues. All being healed, all being healed, being healed right now, right now. Swelling on the ankle has just been healed. I give you the glory, Lord, for every miracle happening. being healed. I give you glory. Just worship him, people of God. Worship him. Sing with the angelic host as we declare the glory of God. OCD. OCD is being healed right now. Thank you, Jesus. Depression is going right now. Anxiety is going right now. I give you the honor, Lord. Crohn's disease. Someone with Crohn's disease being healed right now. I give you the glory, Jesus. Can't tell you. Somebody watching with Crohn's disease. The Lord is healing you. You don't wait for me to call out your healing. You claim that right now in the name of Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit is present in this room. The power of the Holy Spirit is present in this room. Thank you, Lord. We give you the glory and the honor. As the worship team continues to sing, what I want you to do is begin to check yourself by faith right now. Check your eyes. Check your ears, check your limbs, check your back, check for the tumor, check for the skin disease, check for the pain, check for the problem, check for the ailment, check, check, check right now all over your body. And I want you by faith, begin moving, begin checking. This is your faith in action now. If you have to step out in the aisles to do it, do it. Begin to bend, begin to move. If there was paralysis and numbness, you're going to notice that the feeling has come back. If there was a tumor, you'll notice it's gone. If there was skin disease, you'll see that the skin has cleared up. If the Lord has healed you, these will be the things that you see. Somebody's eyes, I'm telling you, somebody's eyes have been healed. Somebody's ears. Check for the pain. Check for the ailment. Right now, right now, right now, right now. The anointing is flowing. The anointing is flowing. Check, check, check. Give me the honor, Lord. Give me the honor. Now what I want you to do, how many of you sense the power of God? Come over, you just wave, wave, wave. Look around the room, guys. There was that, that tangible touch that I was telling you about, and I can sense it on my body right now. There was something that shifted in the atmosphere. But you're in this place now, you're in this place now, and, and, and you test it, you believe you're healed, just wave at me. Wave at me, you believe God healed you. Okay, I need everyone who God healed, you're waving at me. Come stand right where these guys are. They're waving you down right here. Get out of your seat. You're going to come testify about what the Lord has done for you. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise as these people come to testify of God's healing power? Just come out of your seat. Come, come, come. Don't be afraid. You believe God's healed you. Come. Look at all these healing miracles, guys. You believe God's healed you. Come out of your seat and come stand right here. I give you the glory, Jesus. I give you the glory, Jesus. Give you glory. Can't we just lift our hands and thank Him? Praying in the Holy Ghost now. Thank Him, thank Him, thank Him, thank Him, thank Him, thank Him, thank Him. Jesus. You do miracles so great. I feel such a strong anointing right now. There is no one else like you. Tell them, church. 
There is no one else like you, for you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. Father, I pray there be a tangible touch of your presence on this room. Those of you in the crowd, you can be seated. Those of you in line, stay in line. I want to hear what the Lord has done tonight. Diga, this is Leroy. For several years, he's had arthritis in his back, even came with pain. And he said the presence of God came upon him strongly, and the pain is gone. Show me. Can you bend over? Show me. Say again. He's God's good. I mean, you know, when the presence comes on you and the water starts running out of your eyes, what can you say? It's just the power of God. What did you sense when the Lord healed you? Pardon? What did you sense when the Lord healed you? I just felt his presence. I mean, just more than just tangible presence. You know, just, I mean, just the presence. I mean, it's, you know, it's just unbelievable. Can you try to describe the tangible side of it? It's beyond unbelief. Huh? Yeah. I mean, if, if you ever got it, I mean, I don't know if people's ever, you know, felt a hot spot, what I call a hot spot, where it just almost knocks you on the ground. I mean, you're just aware, just, you know, that's the presence of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it beautiful? His power, His presence. Lift your hands, sir. How long have you been dealing with this pain? Oh, several years. You know, it's been... And Jesus, oh, wow, Jesus makes you whole tonight. Jesus makes you whole tonight. Isn't this just awesome? You see, to us, it's a testimony. To him, it's a brand new life he's going yeah. back to. His life forever transformed, completely yeah. healed by God's power. And even with this right there, no pain as they're picking you up? Pardon? No pain as they're picking you up? No. You go rejoicing in your miracle. God bless you. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise for what he's done tonight? What happened here, Ruben? Diga Paula here, 20 years now, has had issues with lower disc. She said it's caused back pain, hip pain, shoulder pain, neck pain, you name it. She's had pain all over her body for 20 years now. She said today the Lord touched her. She was trembling in her seat. And she said she's now able to move like she hasn't before. You're probably more agile than I am. What caused this pain? Was it an injury or just a deteriorating disc? What was it? I had several injuries, um, accidents, a uh, car accident, a horse fall. Um, I had Lyme disease, so a lot of arthritis. And tonight when the Holy Spirit healed you, when Jesus healed you by the power of the Holy Spirit, what did you, what did you feel on you? I had had a terrible headache and neck ache and a hip problem, and I felt just him washing over me, and I was trembling while I was praying. And then I just was like, oh, my headache's gone. And I can move my neck and my hip, and I feel really good. I can pick up my legs, no problem. Where normally I'm like walking with a limp. How do you normally walk? Show me. How did you walk in here tonight? Like that? And then how about tonight? Afterwards, show us. <laughs> That's beautiful. Can we sing it out to him? You are great. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. Isn't that beautiful, church? Lift your hands, sing it. There is no
picked you up right now, you, you went, woo. I didn't know if I wanted to get up. <laughs> what are you feeling right now? I'd like to ask if uh, the Lord will touch me and heal my allergies. I have been dealing with anaphylaxis. The same Jesus who healed your back and your disc heals your allergies too. And all who agreed said, as a matter of fact, Steve, come here. Steve has been going through a, nothing major, so don't freak out. With his voice, he just uses it so much. So you notice tonight he was taking breaks and I was taking over. I'm not as good as him, so forgive me. But he, thanks for thank you, bro. But but you know, he, so 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 why don't we do this? I want you all to stretch your hands towards Steve. Yeah. Let's believe for Steve's healing. Come on, Britton, come lay hands. Sergio, come lay hands. Stretch your hands toward him. Let's pray that God would heal his throat. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray that your healing virtue would touch Steve's voice. And I pray, Father, that this would be a new season, a new season of favor and breakthrough in his ministry. Lord, I pray that as you begin to bring healing to his voice, as he begins to steward it and take care of it, Lord, that you would begin to give him those visions and those dreams that you've shown. But Lord, let them come to pass. Let them come to pass in this next season. Lord, we pray you elevate this ministry. Lord, we pray you give them those songs that you promised that would go around the world. And Lord, we pray you do it in the next few months. Let those songs come to him. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, For you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. Wow. There is no one else like you. Chorus of Agnes Day, please, as Sergio testifies. Diga, this is Gayla. Since 2016, she found out that she had digestion failure. Even the doctor said that they didn't know she was even gonna wake up the next morning. She said during service, she felt bolts of electricity flowing through her body and she believes that she's healed. She came with her aunt because she was invited and the Lord healed her. Tell me what happened tonight. Um, well, we were back here, you know, we were praising God and, and you were talking about, um, you know, just receive your healing, keep praying in the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, and just a bolt of lightning. I mean, my aunt knew. It's just like... Where's the aunt? The aunt, I should say. Not, not the aunt, the aunt. Come here. She's the one who brought me here. She brought you, and you're feeling like electricity. Yeah, I mean, it was just like a bolt, you know, like I bumped into her. It was just like, oh, you know, like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't When's the last time you felt something like that? Yeah, well, I mean, I just... I knew if I came, the manifestation would be here. I didn't doubt it. And and this is your aunt right here. You brought, this is your niece? And you, why, why did you invite her to this? Because I knew she needed to come get healing. You knew that you knew that you knew, or did you just know? Well, I, I knew it. I didn't just know, but. You had that deep inner witness. She, she sent me your messages, and she said, please listen, Galen. I need you to come to this conference with me. That's the power of God here, guys. Whoa. Receive it all, receive it all, receive it all. Thank you, Jesus. That's the power of God on her. You see this? This is what Jesus does. Whoa. If you want that, lift your hands and pray in the Holy Spirit. Come on. It's such power here tonight, guys. Such power here tonight. And you'll never be the same. What are you feeling on you right now? What? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What are you feeling on you? I'm just feeling like I'm just feeling like I'm new. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. You guys go rejoicing in your miracle. God bless you. What happened here, Ruben? 
Do you guys have Grace here who's had problem with her vision since she was a child? She's had to wear contacts, she's had to wear glasses, but she said most recently for the past year now has had discomfort in her right eye to the point where contact lenses don't even help. She said it hurts all the time, but she said today in service she was praying. She had her eyes closed and she said in an instant she opened her eyes and she noticed her vision was regained back. She said she's able to see properly now. We need to stand and give the Lord a hand of praise. He still opens eyes. No, I have to know. I have to know. You can sit down. You can sit down. I have to know. You're crying. These tears don't lie. How long have you had this problem with your eyes? So I've had eye issues since I was in second grade. However, the right eye being like really inflamed and uncomfortable has been for the past year or so. I struggled with it every single day. And so, yeah, I was just praying today. And when you, you said someone had their, their eyes healed, I, I opened up my eyes and I can see clearly and the discomfort was gone. And I was like, that's me. <laughs> talking about me. <laughs> well, the Lord, the Lord told me, I knew that I knew that I knew someone in here was experiencing a real miracle with their eyes. And that was you. Isn't that amazing? So how, how surprised were you? Or elated, I should say, because I'm sure you had the faith for it. What was that moment like when you opened your eyes and everything was clear? I don't know how to describe it. I just, I'm so thankful. Like, thank you, Jesus. Really, thank you. And he wants to use you. He wants to use your life. And that heaviness that the enemy tries to assault you with, the Lord is lifting that today. The Lord is lifting that today. Lift your hands. It's a holy moment, church. Something's happening here in her life. And Jesus, I ask you, place your hand on her and let her experience that resurrection power. And Father, anoint her for ministry and give her the words to speak to women and young girls who are hurting. Give her her heart's desire, Lord, that she might minister to those who are hurting like she was hurting. I pray you grant it in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. There's power flowing here tonight. You can feel it. It's strong here very strong. And you watching online, I pray God touches you through that camera lens too. But I'd advise you, get down to these meetings. God wants to use you in ministry. God wants to use you in ministry. Let him do it. And go rejoicing in your healing. Sergio, what happened here? Diga, this is Carol. For 11 years, she dealt with pain in the shin, close to the knee, and she got healed tonight. She could lift her leg up. There's no more pain. And the Lord healed her eyesight. She said that when she would take off her glasses, it was blurry. When she took them off this time, she said it's completely gone. She can see perfect now. So you took them off and your eyes are clear. Yes, uh, I heard the Holy Spirit say, take your glasses off and see if you can see so I can see, I can, you know, everything around me. I can. So when you put them back on, do your eyes get blurry because you no longer need them? <laughs> it's better with them off. And so the Lord healed your eyes, and then what was wrong with your shins? Well, many years ago, I fell down on some concrete. And so I was having really bad pain, and it was heavy to lift up, but it's good. I'm no pain. Yeah. Try this. No pain. No pain. Would that have hurt before? Yes, it would have. 
Now, what did you sense when the power of the Holy Spirit touched you? I felt his presence, his, his peace, and it was like he was, he was doing something in me, you know. Yeah, even, even to down here, I could feel him moving. It's the power of God on you. It's the power of God on you. Father, let her never be the same again. Let her never be the same again. In the mighty name of Jesus. Mighty name of Jesus. Let her never be the same again. I got to know. You just jolted back right now. You just jolted back right now. What did you feel? I felt him. Him touched me. Like shaking. Yeah. <laughs> That's the power of God. You go rejoicing in your healing tonight. If you can help her out, Patrick, please. There's somebody over there. Do we have, oh, we have people helping. Thank God. Britain, we have people there. Come on back, my friend. What happened here? Diga, I have Toby here who had an incident four months ago where she fell. She said she fell and she injured her back. She said she fractured a bone in her lower back. She said ever since then, she's had discomfort lower back. She said standing, sitting, sleeping, excruciating pain. She said today she felt the Holy Spirit touch her. And she said she began to test her body right after that moment. She said she began to bend over, lift up her legs. She said the pain is gone. Thank you, Lord, for this. It's uh, completely all gone. The pain is all gone. And to Jesus. It's beautiful here. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. There's a shift here. Lift your hands. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Father, let us never take for granted that which you're doing. Let us never take for granted that which you're doing. Now, tomorrow night, church, I'm going to minister a simple message for the believer, for you. Tonight was for the unbeliever. Tomorrow night, I'm ministering on living a supernatural life and how to walk in God's power. And then we're going to minister to the sick. But tomorrow, I'm going to spend more time praying and ministering tomorrow night. What time is it? Perfect timing, then. And... This service, we thank God for what he did. How many of you can just sense that heavy weight of God's glory here? It's a beautiful thing. And so we're going to close the service. I'm going to say goodnight to those of you watching online. Can we say goodnight by giving a round of applause to those joining us online? God bless you guys. We will see you tomorrow night. Join in. Tune in.